Gavin Newsom. And just today, he announced that he wants to push forward a 28th Amendment that will uh, kind of uh, uh, enact some, quote unquote, common sense gun re regulations across the land. Uh, and uh, I did pull a, a clip from his his announcement of that that I was curious to get your reaction to. And then we can speak a little bit more about California after that. But first, let's hear from Gavin Newsom. Every time it's the same. They tell us we can't stop these massacres. They tell us we have to stand by and watch tragedy after tragedy unfold in our communities. They say we can't stop domestic terrorism without violating the Second Amendment. And the thoughts and prayers are the best we can do. I'm here to say that's a lie. So today, I'm proposing the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution to do just that. It raises the minimum age to purchase a firearm from 18 to 21. It mandates universal background checks and institutes reasonable waiting periods for all gun purchases. And it bans civilians from buying assault rifles, those weapons of war our founding fathers never foresaw. This will guarantee states as well the ability to enact common sense gun safety laws while leaving the Second Amendment intact and respecting America's gun owning tradition. For the last two years, I've seen Newsom in particular do this weird rebranding of I don't know, the so-called positive liberties as the real definition of freedom or something. So I don't know if you guys recall his little campaign, but he's like, well, actually, freedom in California means the right to have an abortion you know, paid for and the right to be free of gun violence. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's part of this like, I don't know, I, I think he imagines it as like it's California competing against Florida in, in just a persuasive redefinitions of what like American liberty actually means. And maybe that's sophisticated, but I don't really get the angle other than um. It's just a convenient way for people to embrace the pink police state or something. Uh, and of course, we all know what his 28th Amendment thing here means. It's just a clever way of saying liberals will always like to pretend to be originalists or constitutionalists when they when they grab your guns. You know, it's it's pretty vulgar to me. That's my initial reaction. Yeah, I, I wonder about and I just I'm always wondering, you know, you're, because you're you're play you're constantly playing this game where you're trying to stay a, a step ahead of what they're going to do next. And at the moment it appears you you are a step ahead because they're still fighting over these 80 percent receivers and you've created the zero percent receiver so that conversation seems to be in different stages right now but what one thing that california seems to be trying to do to get, get after this problem is uh to use liability laws uh to hold either gun uh manufacturers or gun sellers liable for uh, any shootings that happen with the guns. Uh, and what, one example here, uh, just earlier this week, LAPD found 700 ghost guns. Now it's getting $5 million. Basically, they uh, recovered uh, ghost guns that were used in the ambush of some LA County Sheriff's deputies in Compton uh, in a home invasion and a triple murder. And uh, you, they settled with Polymer 80, which is a competing ghost gun kit seller for $5 million. So do, does seeing stories like this worry you that kind of the, that that's ultimately going to be the fate of defense distributed, that people are going to use ghost guns to commit crimes and then they're going to somehow try to come after you and, and hold you liable if it could be traced back to it was created on a ghost gunner? Well, uh, fortunately or, or not, this is already our reality. It's not like this hasn't happened yet. Uh, Paul Brady is taking most of these hits these days, and I, and I agree with you in the general approach, both of gun control and like state and municipal authorities. They imagine a better, like big tobacco like approach, where okay, the big, the biggest suppliers, let's say Smith and Wesson, the actual gun suppliers, they at least have the um, pro forma protection of what's called the placa. I don't know if you guys know about the placa, but you know, protection of lawful commerce and arms mm -hmm. act, something like that. So okay, well they can't, you know. They're still trying to pierce it, right? Because um, you'll remember the big Remington settlement after Sandy Hook, and that that itself was was a pretty sad thing because like the insurers decided to settle, they didn't decide to press the issue on the placard or the two A, and so I have seen consortiums, you know, like a legal meets where these gun controllers get together and say, all right, our new strategy is placa. We can at least beat them all up in court and get the insurance carriers to settle so much that it forces 
you know, as good capitalists, that forces them to make a safer product. They'll label it differently. They'll put, you know, weird orange tips and safety features on the guns and things. So that's in earnest their approach. And of course, it gives them this pro-social, whatever, this kind of progressive feeling about it, while it also masks, I guess, the uh, it's pure ideology, but it also masks how well they're actually engaging in gun control by capitalism now, rather than like strictly as a kind of ideological approach. But uh, back to your point, I've been in California alone. I've, I've also been sued. I was uh, sued in uh, the Tahama ghost gun shooting and a number of ghost gun companies were sued, um, including Black Hawk. We were sued for 500 million, I think, hmm. half, half a billion dollars. Uh, you know, yeah, you get concerned when you're sued for half a billion dollars anytime hmm. someone uh, has a, uses a ghost gun. So uh, to, to the point in the, in the article that you just previewed, well, the accusation that they don't do background checks um, this is a this is a problem, right? There again, they're trying to redefine the duty of care of a ghost gun company. That company's not selling guns. That company can't use the NICS system, even if it wanted to. Uh, and so, a little bit, you know, this is all workshopped for PR. This is all kind of part of a, a broader campaign of pushing people in this direction to make expectations, have expectations, like the big tobacco fight. This is my read about it. But right. to, your, to your point, will will this be the future of? If, yes, of course. As as these kit guns are used in crimes and things. Yes, I think we'll be hauled into every single court. We're often threatened with it. There was a big New York suit very recently uh, that brought a bunch of suppliers in. I, I think we weren't brought in because at this point, um, we have a reputation for being very litigious. Like they don't always want to just litigate with us. So they kind of pick lower hanging fruit maybe or softer mm -hmm. targets. Uh, but you know, look, I've gotten plenty of behind the scenes, private letters from Letitia James. Pick your favorite AG, you know, like they're always threatening to do. And that will be the future. That the chunk of metal that you have, you know, at what point does that become a gun uh, and does it stop being, uh, you know, uh, merely a block of metal? These these are the most interesting questions. And to use your analogy, like the drug or scheduling analogy like that's uh, I saw California. Now other states are beginning to use a, a war on drugs vocabulary to regulate uh, gun components. And this is so much fun they say precursor parts right precursor parts to firearms yeah. it's already the connotation's already there that like there's something wrong that you would have components that might go into a gun or fit into a gun mm -hmm. and there's something implied about the scheduling of these components outside of their quality of you know being i don't know they have their own legal requirement for regulation and, and i watched california uh deal with this question since 2019 each year they were just about to create a new regime for uh, precursor parts. And they even had one at one point, but they used COVID to kind of skip ahead and just accomplish what they wanted anyway. Uh, you know, no spoilers here. Uh, you're not allowed to have them, but they, they ended up merging precursor parts with uh, the new enthusiasm for banning unfinished receivers because hmm. the states, the several liberal blue states ended up mostly just copying language from hmm. Biden's ghost gun rule, which we've already discussed here saying, well, whatever's regulated by the atf it's regulated here too a, f a funny consequence of that is in california for example right now california law is really specific to the federal rules so it says only those things that are federally regulated can be sold in california well because of vandersock and the future summary judgment that's going to knock out biden's rule california will be in this awkward position where the, their their law means nothing can be sold in california because nothing's federally regulated anymore <laughs> Uh, is there um, is there any room for federalism in gun laws, uh, you know, for you? Uh, so, you know, does California have the right or Los Angeles say, or San Francisco? Do they have the right to have different gun laws than, uh, you know, uh, Dallas, Texas, Austin, Huntsville, Texas, uh, where I spent two years? Uh, you know, I mean, is is there a is there room for that or are these kind of universal rights, which must be universally respected in all contexts? That's an, that's an awesome question. Uh, I think in practical terms, in practical political terms, we have to make concessions. Like obviously mm -hmm. San Francisco is always going to be hostile in a way that, you know, view of Texas is not. Yeah. What I don't like, or at least what I can't accept is the fact that Newsom and there, there's this new, the, these progressive nostrums mean we have to empower our state or local authorities to reach outside of our state jurisdiction, county jurisdiction, mm -hmm. municipal borders, and go attack companies uh, and, and, and people in other states and other jurisdictions. Yep. So uh, unfortunately, though, I would like to make practical federal federalist concessions in theory, right, because I want to be a good American. In practice, these are almost impossible to concede now because there are some, something like civil war conditions in the courts. And 
I, this is not an exaggeration. I spent most of last year fighting California because California passed AB 1621 and 17. Well, I, I forget the other ones that they had, but in combination, they meant, you know, if you're selling something in Texas, like a ghost gun kit, we'll just empower any of our private citizens or gun control groups to sue you anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, to just go, just go and sue you. So unfortunately, um, I think we're, we're kind of in a post federalist conversation and um, it would be deadly to just say, well, I'm a good constitutional. So please, everyone in California, please come sue me. That was an excerpt from our live stream with Cody Wilson. If you want to see the full conversation, go here. If you want to see another excerpt, go here and come back next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time when Zach Weismuller and I will be talking to somebody very interesting on the Reason live stream.